purposes. Right. They are modular, so they started <laughs> with a simple roguelike code. Okay. They had a set of modules. And then they have, I think, seven or eight variants for placing enemies right. in every dungeon. So it's so high. Like so it's a hybrid. Yeah. So maybe we'll give them half a point or something like that. Um, there are objects to find and locate. The way things react in Skyrim is pretty much the best example, one of the best examples of games throwing up weird things that you don't expect based on rules in the game, right? So I think we get uh, two points for that, but it's not turn-based, uh, definitely not turn-based. And death is definitely not final. I suppose you could play a mod, does that count? I don't know, we're not talking about it. So I think it counts as a game with roguelike elements. It's two and a half-ish. Right arrow. Minecraft. This is interesting. So Minecraft is obviously procedurally generated. Gets a point straight away. Objects to discover in the world. Isn't the game all about discovering objects and working out how they interact with each other as well? And working out objects that have, how these things affect things in different ways. I would say it scores points for both of the next two things. Turn-based, no. Death isn't final. So Minecraft is a roguelike-like, which is interesting. Is there? Is there a mode where death is final in Minecraft? That's true. Upgrade it. It's a roguelike. Minecraft is a roguelike. Get, someone get in touch with Microsoft. Like They might want to upgrade or downgrade their money at this point. It is a crafting game. You're saying that games can be two different things. That's unbelievable. Right arrow. Chess. Uh. So wait, chess has procedural generation? No. Does it have objects to collect? No. Does it have systems which throw up interesting combinations based on rules of individual monsters and things? I think it does. I think chess counts there, right? Is it turn-based? Should be, if you're playing it correctly, should be. <laughs> and is death final in chess? <laughs> for, for, for the player. It's dangerous, right? So, so chess is a roguelike-like. Yeah. Right arrow. Life. Guys. <laughs> is life a roguelike? All right, OK. Is life, wait. Are the environments procedurally generated? Do you believe in intelligent design? <laughs> it's not for me to say. I suppose whether or not you believe in a creator, this conversation's gone way above me. I suppose they are procedurally generated. They're generated somehow, not by us, and it's different for everybody. We're all playing in different environments, aren't we? Your house is different from mine. It better be. Otherwise, things have gone wrong. Uh, okay, so let's, well, let's see. Um, objects. Are there objects in life? You're all confident. Yes, I've seen them. They're everywhere. There's a bag, a chair. All right. Do those objects have simple rules and interact with each other in an interesting and unpredictable way, particularly when you're drunk? <laughs> yes. Wait a second. Is it turn-based? Depends how polite you are, right? Like, it's prob I don't know. It's probably not turn-based. People tend to move whether you move or not. I've noticed that. <laughs> and is death final? <laughs> Again, so I think whether, you, whether or not you believe death, or f death is final generally comes down to your religious worldview. So basically, whether or not life is a roguelike comes down to your belief uh, in, uh, in an omnipotent creator. So I can't answer that one. That one goes above the... Alto board of roguelikes. Right arrow. That brings us back to this beautiful thing, which I don't think I had a picture of before, but you can see the, the sort of dwarves up there. You can see a lake there. You can see grass. You can see some storage areas there. Like, I read that map there. I read that map like a story, just looking at that. And to most of you, it will be a meaningless jumble of things, right? But you see the C and the little Zs there. 
the arrow up, everything there means something to me. And that's amazing for a game to just make. It's like learning a foreign language. That's why it took me eight weeks, eight weeks to get inside that world. Dwarf Fortress is my favorite type of game, like no question. That isn't because it is or isn't a roguelike. We haven't checked that out. But because it's an outlier, because it's a weird thing. It exists right on the fringes of games, and it's broken, like it's totally broken, and it's totally brilliant. It will throw up things that you do not expect all of the time. It is the sort of thing we all should be aspiring to make, the sort of game that pushes boundaries, because like I said right at the start, our medium is emerging. We're lucky, we're frontiers people, right? We, we, sit there and we have this opportunity to push and see new things and Dwarf Fortress <laughs> is doing that in its crazy way. Uh, Dwarf Fortress is funded by donations. There are people who care so much about this world that this dude has made, this crazy broken world, that they just give him money every month and they've been doing this for a long time before Kickstarter, a long time before Patreon was a thing. They were just like Please keep making this game. I will keep paying for it every month. Because it's crazy and it's beautiful and it's like nothing else. And I can't possibly recommend any of you play it because it takes eight weeks to learn it. But if you do, you might experience something like the thing I told you at the start. Um, to explain briefly how it works, you start with a caravan of seven dwarves. So already it's failing that stupid thing in the Berlin Convention where you only allow one. Uh, so I only got the seven dwarves joke quite recently. Uh, it turns out that's a reference. Uh, and this thing here is a procedurally generated landscape, right? Not in the sense of Rogue where it's gone, oh, put a, put a little lake there and another one there and we'll give you this amount of land. It generates the whole world with history and tribes and um, you know, ecosystems and each of those squares has temperature and there's all kinds of craziness going on. Basically, it evolves that world through years and years and years and years. The world has legends. You will find graves of things that have happened. Some whole civilizations get exterminated during the source. Your game will be completely different. Your world will be different. Your history will be different when you play to a fortress. What makes it even more painful is you see this world and then you define a tiny bit of it to play in and an even smaller bit of that and that's what you end up with. And actually for all that it matters, maybe it could have just said, okay, give me some green and put three different lakes there. But then you'd know, right? I know there's history behind that and I know that the rocks beneath it and the rivers that flow through it, all of those have a history too. And I know that the tribes that invite, invade me, they'll have a history. And the armor that they're wearing is made from some other culture that they've stolen it from. It's crazy. It's a crazy game. Stupidly involved. And that's why it's so exciting, because all of these systems come together. They kiss. And they make things you don't expect, like my queen, right? like my story. And that genuinely happened. So is it a roguelike? I mean, of course it is. It's procedurally generated. It involves all kinds of objects, it involves complex manipulation of those objects, it involves uh, systemic stuff, that's the whole game, is weird little systems that play with each other and interact. Is it turn-based? It is um, in the sense that it all plays out turn by turn and if you don't do something, you're screwed. Uh, and is death final? So final, like the most final thing. And after four days of playing it, you will find yourself you know, you'll make one mistake and it'll all be over and all you'll have is the story you've written. But you will have that story. And that's massive. Um, I mean, to, <laughs> I've got time. to give you a, a, an example, one of my favourite, less serious stories about Dwarf Fortress uh, read on the internet. And you can find loads. I mean, I, I almost, I don't know if any of you play EVE Online, but EVE Online is a similar thing in that the stories around EVE Online, which is this big spaceship game, are the best stories in the world. They're amazing, like brilliant to read. The game itself is a painful look like thing, <laughs> learning process, and it's like hard work, really hard work. But the stories are incredible. Dwarf Fortress is kind of similar. I love it, but I would never ever inflict it on you. But go online and read the stories. Um, 
you can play Dwarf Fortress in a different mode, adventure mode, where you are just like a roguelike single character moving across the world and just finding things trying to survive. And to give you an example of how interesting the sort of bugs or broken things in it. Is the mode simpler than that? Sorry? Is the mode simpler than the original mode? Is the mod simpler? Is the adventure mode simpler than the yeah, original Yeah, I believe mode? it is, although I'm hardcore, so I've never touched it. <laughs> uh, no, I've, I, I've heard that the adventure mode is a good place to start, but I just went in on that thing. Um, it's, it's just, a, it's like a roguelike, moving slowly across this amazingly created world, and you'll find other people's fortresses, civilizations. You can even, after your fortress is collapsed, and indeed my queen's fortress like exists in a tiny save file on my hard disk, I could load up adventure mode and I could explore the burnt out ruins of my own fortress, which is amazing, right? You make history and then you explore it. But I remember reading a story of one guy who was having a really good time in adventure mode. Uh, he got some good armor and then suddenly he was on the way to a city and he got ambushed when he wasn't expecting it. And he was already injured. So he was limping away from this guy he had no weapon, sorry, the first blow that happened hit him in the wrist and broke his wrist because Dwarf Fortress models individual bones, broke his wrist and so he dropped his sword and he's like, my game can't end like this, Jesus Christ, I can't, what am I going to do? Like, because he's put hours into this and he's doing well, but just one lucky hit and that's life, right? That's life. So the guy is limping away and then he's got an idea. So he takes off his helmet, and as he's running away, he throws it at the guy, and it hits him, and it hurts him, but it doesn't really stop the situation. So then he takes off his top, and he does the same. And eventually, he's down to just his socks, throwing them, and his last sock breaks the guy's wrist <laughs> and disarms him, and then he's able to club him to death. Maybe with the other sock, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, obviously that's ridiculous, and physically that's not how socks work, as I understand it. <laughs> but imagine, that's, imagine making a game where that system can arrive, and imagine other people telling you about it, and then just wanting to play it, and then going in and finding it takes eight weeks of work to play it. <laughs> uh, it's pretty amazing. So where were we? That was a, a story. Is it roguelike? Yeah, we've done that, and it is brutally, brutally, brutally difficult. So, there we go. We went through all of those games, and they were all sort of, they've all been defined as roguelikes, apart from Skyrim, Minecraft, the last few we do, uh, at some time. And we found out some of them were roguelike likes, some of them had roguelike elements, some of them were roguelikes, like solid roguelikes. It was all sort of vaguely unsatisfying because we had arguments about it along the route. And while I had set out to provide this crystal definition, which I still think is slightly better than the Berlin one. It was a little bit, like, unsatisfying, I think. And maybe that shows what's wrong here. Because the truth is that genres, while they're useful as stereotypes, are kind of like a stupid adolescent distraction. They're good for putting things in groups and saying, hey, you like this thing, maybe you'll like this thing. But those games are all miles away from each other. There is no chance... I will ever, ever enjoy playing Rogue Legacy, which has roguelike elements. But there is no chance I will ever fall out of love with Dwarf Fortress, like, which is phenomenal. They're miles away from each other. The Crypt of the Necrodancer, I'm going to go and play because it sounds like exactly my sort of thing. But there are other games on that list that aren't. Like, roguelike is not particularly useful. But then, is first-person shooters shooter or is... RPG, they're good starting points, but they don't really mean much. The only true roguelike, I've lost my place in the, um, in the presentation, that's okay. Right arrow. The only true roguelike is rogue, right? That's basically it. Even the ones that are straight derivatives, things that people have taken rogue and built on that, I really recommend playing, if you're going to play a game, Rogue is great, but that's the original. The version I prefer is um, NetHack, which is available for all formats, and I think NetHack is great. Um, and you can get it for your iOS device and your Android device pretty cheaply. Uh, probably best play on a computer because they're awkward. Um, 
But even those fail that Berlin def uh, definition of roguelike on some weird things, which kind of, you know, shows that the Berlin guys seem to set out to say, right, we're just going to list what rogue is, and then you sort of get points for each of those, and then maybe you're roguelike or maybe not. It didn't solve it, neither did we, but we came, clo Ooh, we came closer, and I think we can be proud of that. Um, so, yes, that's where we were. So rather than thinking about games in terms of genres, which we've just decided, I've just decided, are unhelpful, we should think about games in terms of elements. And we've been through elements of roguelikes, which are all awesome and useful today. I would say that this fashion, this trend currently, and I don't know if you looked at the dates there, but most of those games were like 2010 to 2014, and that's just the standout successful one. Steam, Steam is awash with roguelikes. The fashion, though, for roguelikes is not really a fashion for roguelikes at all. It's a fashion for player-unique experiences. Right arrow. And each of those things, those things that I've got on the board, the things that we came up with earlier, each of those things can create a unique experience for the player. It does create a unique experience for the player. So procedural generation of environments, that's pretty straightforward. Like every time any one of us plays Don't Starve or any one of us plays, uh, plays Spelunky, we'll get a different map. We'll have a different experience. It's unique to us. Object discovery, manipulation and management. My experience in the game will not be aided by you telling me exactly what to do with these things because I will get a different selection of objects. And indeed, systemic object interaction will change how those objects, when two of those objects are in pro close proximity, everything will change again. So each of those first three things all combine to make our experiences unique. And that's really, really important. We own them. We own the story. The fourth one, I was turn-based, I wasn't sure about whether it fits with unique experiences. I decided it sort of does, in a way, because it affords you thinking time. And obviously, you can get that by pausing as well, but it's not the same. I think in turn-based experiences, you're kind of filling in the gaps between each move with your thoughts and trying to think one step, one step ahead of your opponent, like in chess as well. So yeah, I think that turn-based games also help afford you unique experiences. Certainly, you're acting more on your own um, thoughts rather than instinct, animal instinct. And finally, death is final. And that's massive to telling stories because every story needs an ending. So these are not shared experiences. Right arrow. Which is so vogue, right? Like right now, every single app has like a share this experience, share, 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 share. It's not the same story. So we can all gather the next day and go, oh, did you see what happened last night on TV? Or do you see what happened in the sport game? It's all different. It's about sharing experiences, about creating your own. Um, in my talk the other day, I talked about The Last of Us. How many people have played The Last of Us here? I'm expecting slightly more than that. I'm kind of pleased to see it, so few. The Last of Us is a great game on its own terms. Like, it is a ludicrously, brilliantly produced video game. It's spectacular. If you're going to make AAA games, you'll look at things in The Last of Us and you'll be intimidated. But I think it is a huge misstep for video games, or at least, and I think that the, 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 the number of Game of the Year awards it won was a misstep. It's not the future. Because The Last of Us tells the same story to every single person. And is that really where we're strongest? It's not. The place we're strongest is by letting us all tell our own stories. Interactivity. In The Last of Us, it doesn't matter what I do in the brief period of interactivity between two amazing cutscenes. What happens next is always the same. And I can't go to any of you, hey, guys, guess what happened to me last night in The Last of Us? You'll be like, yeah, it happened to me too. That's how that game works. Might as well have been watching a movie. That's kind of more important right now than anything else because of this dude.
right arrow. Right? YouTube is founded, Let's Plays are founded on sharing your experiences with other people. On taking a game and playing it through, adding your pithy commentary, but also providing a unique thing and getting excited about that because it's yours, it's your story. You're living and you're writing your story. So any of those elements of roguelikes, it kind of doesn't matter whether you are a roguelike, roguelike-like, roguelike-like-like, that you can take and put in your game, help create a unique experience for your game. That's why that stuff is popular. It's popular right now because it's cool and it's fun. It's popular because guys like that love to share things like that. And that's why people are putting more and more of those things in your game, in their game. Right arrow. That's basically it. Um, I did want to tell you a brief story about uh, debugging. About it's, it's more of a cautionary note. Because it's nice to put all of these uh, objects in your game and say, we're going to have them all interact in a billion different ways. But of course, while that's amazing for the player, and the player will discover things like they can throw socks and break people's wrists, it's not great for your QA departments who have to debug the way an infinite number of things cross over. Um, I uh, heard a story about an MMO, which is secret. Uh, about an MMO um, not long ago. And this MMO was in closed, uh, closed beta. And I've changed some of the facts in this story, so good luck trying to detect what it is. Um, in this MMO, there was a town with civilians and NPCs. And um, they st they, there was a forest nearby with enemies. And that's how those games work, right? You, you're in the town and someone says, go and kill three goblins. You go off to kill three goblins and kill them. You come back and go, oh, great, thanks. Now go and kill four goblins. All right, cool. Uh, go kill four goblins. Uh, all right, now I've run and need more goblins. OK. So uh, quite simple. Like all of these things designed to interact with each other a little bit, you can maybe kill the NPCs. You've got to be ludicrously high level to do that. Anyway, on some server instances, they, um, the, uh, the guys at the dev were getting reports that there was a huge deer running around killing all the NPCs and any player who spawned in the town, right? And they were like, okay, we'll check it out. And sure enough, there was a deer, so they killed it, like, okay. Fair enough, it <laughs> must be a glitch or something. But then it kept coming back. And after a while, you're like, we've, guys, we've got to do something about this deer. It's really negatively impacting player experience. It's spawning in the room and killing everyone. But the weird thing was, there weren't any deer anywhere near. Like, the cat, the, there shouldn't have been a deer within, you know, even in the sort of realm of the game. There was only deer, like, on the other side of the forest, way far away. So, to cut a long story short, they eventually found out what had happened. And what was happening was this. Also, the point is that deer are like placid creatures. They shouldn't be killing anyone, right? They should just be milling around. So, and there was no enemy, enemies anywhere near them that should have made them angry. But what was happening was, the deer was being set into aggro mode and chasing, um, running, fleeing into the forest where it was meeting all these little goblins that you were meant to kill as a low level thing and it was slowly leveling up, killing these things. Not all the time, sometimes the goblins would kill it. But because this stuff is not exactly predictable, rolling dice, it was leveling up. And then eventually, the deer was running out of food in the forest, and it was like, well, I'm hungry. Oh, there's a town over there. And the deer would go over to the town, and then it'd start killing all the NPCs for food. So, makes sense, right? But they still can't work out why the deers are getting angry. It makes, that, that makes no sense, because all these deers are just in this field, and they are just sort of, they're sat there, 
mostly calm, but then for a second, they just suddenly freak out, and that's how they end up in the forest. Anyway, they track that down. It turned out the instance of the realm's dungeon had been built by the coders to be below the surface, right? Not for any geographical reason, just you need a place to put these in space. So they just dropped it down there, right? Far out of where the player could see it because it's below all of this land. So there's a dungeon down there. And in this dungeon is a huge boss creature. And the huge, huge boss creature has this huge radius around it, which is set to set any creature that goes inside it to aggro. And this radius was just creeping above the ground. So actually, you had this strange bubble, like invisible bubble, which was just sometimes wandering into a little deer who was freaking the hell out for no apparent reason, bombing it into the woods, manic, and then killing goblins and killing NPCs. So little things seem like a good thing, but they're not always a good thing. All you can do is embrace it. Embrace your bugs if you're going to go down that path and hope that it ends up with someone throwing a sock at someone's wrist. I think that's it. Any questions? No questions at all. We have the microphone here if we have any questions. I don't think I have anything else to add. <coughs> I basically have, right arrow, oh, right. right arrow. I have a 20 minute story about Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> so you better ask me questions <laughs> otherwise. Um, yeah. I'd like to ask about the future mm -hmm. of roguelikes or do you, do you want to put your wizard hat on, look into the future of where do you see, or do you see it going somewhere or do you see it dying in, in like, or, uh, I think like all trend explosions, you know, and uh, I think it's really interesting when people get into this mad mashup of like, let's do a roguelike, but with a puzzle game, a platform, or a dancing game, all of that stuff, and it throws up interesting things. But as I sort of said, we're not, it doesn't really matter whether they're roguelikes or roguelike likes, games with roguelike elements, or even rogue itself. What matters is the elements that we're taking and putting in there. So I think that intelligent designers see parts of games they like, like the Halo shield recharge, and go, that's fucking cool. I'm going to include that in my next game. And no one you know, like argues about what they should be called. So I think that that's the future. Is the future is probably lots more boring arguments about whether things are roguelikes or not, to which you can go, we've defined it now. I've got my list. Does it tick off these things? Not a roguelike. Shush. Uh, or... Um, you know, and those arguments exist, and then games using elements of roguelikes to be more um, to be more personal, so that my experience is a you know a storytelling one. And I've been doing that since like I remember. Does anyone remember Elite, the video game, the old Elite? You do, of course. Like space traveling trading game, the huge universe. I used to go into school the next day and tell stories about that because they were my stories. Uh, it's the only game that's ever interested me. I don't think it's any coincidence that those are the games that are most popular on YouTube Let's Plays, that things like Minecraft, where Minecraft is, every time you watch a Minecraft video, you're not just going to watch someone wade through the same level, right? Spelunky Let's Plays, hugely popular because it's funny. It's slapstick when someone dies. Uh, Goat Simulator, a stupid game, but <laughs> it's like your world to own, and that's exciting. Anything else? The Extra Credits uh, video blog guy said that uh, the future of roguelikes might be in user, I user interface design, right. since the more popular ones are actually usable, <laughs> unlike, unlike Dwarf Fortress. Yeah. Uh, but a follow-up question on, on, on that, if, if you don't want to answer that, is, is that, is there how do you see the idea of fidelity affecting future games where there certainly seems to be a place for games like Dwarf Fortress where you f just fill in so much of the game experience which is actually very close to the original Dungeons and Dragons mm -hmm. and role-playing games yeah, yeah. where there is no to be seen. Right, you mean 
so, so one of my points in the original talk, uh, sorry, the, the, the story I said at the start is that the game plays out in my head because graphical fidelity is you know, so minimalist there, I'm writing the stories in the gaps. I think there is something to learn there about not being too explicit to the player and allowing their imagination to fill in the gaps. I am certain Minecraft would not have been the success it had been if it had been more detailed. And I think that that's a cool lesson in abstraction. Um, a really, my favorite example of how to do that is the horror game Amnesia, which is terrifying, absolutely terrifying. But the reason Amnesia is terrifying is because it won't let you look at the monster. If you look at the monster, you lose sanity, and that kills you eventually. So every time you hear the monster clumping around through this house, you have to hide and like not look at it. And then it's your childhood imagination, right? And the thing you're imagining that that thing looks like is way scarier than even the wildest, you know, most depraved graphic artist's imagination. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's a good point. Um, on on the, the other point, the, the uh, um, user interface thing, I'm, I'm torn, right? I want to bring all these games. I would love for all of you to right now go home and experience Dwarf Fortress, just by being able to click through menus. The problem is the fact that it's broken and so crazy to learn and so difficult and punishing. And that journey, that eight-week journey, it's like learning a language, right? You can pick up a phrase book and just go to a... Uh, go to a, a resort town somewhere and you can get through and the waiter will probably speak a bit of English as well so it'll be fine but actually learning a language takes work but the subtlety is so much more rewarding so for every little dumbing down like smoothing of the corners in Dwarf Fortress I worry some of the magic goes and the response to that is yeah we're just going to make some nice buttons and stuff but anyone who's played Dwarf Fortress will know you're going to need a lot of those buttons. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? No? <coughs> okay. Well, I'm going to stick around for a bit uh, afterwards, but thank you all for listening. Um, I won't subject you to Kelly Clarkson. I'll put it online sometime. Uh, thanks. <laughs>